Good morning, everybody. Uh, it is uh, Friday, the March the 27th, a Friday afternoon, although I've started to lose track of what day of the week it is. Uh, I'd have to look it up every time, but uh, welcome back to another uh, short clip on AP Euro that I think can help you all. Uh, what I want to talk about today is uh, the Unit 5 Progress Check Free Response Questions. Uh, so if you take a minute, pause me, uh, go to your AP Classroom and College Board website, and uh, take a look at the Unit 5 Progress Check Free Response Questions. Great, I'm back. Um, so the first of these two questions actually went really well, and I was impressed with how we did. Uh, basically, that question and all of its sub-questions simply asked you to show off your knowledge of the French Revolution, and as long as you correctly identified what the question was asking and responded directly to it, you were good. And I would say uh, most students got three out of three on this, or, or you know, uh, two out of three at least. So I want to talk more, though, about uh, question number two, uh, which was a struggle. So um, part of what's a struggle here, um, if you take a look at that second question, and forgive me looking away. I'm going to kind of read off a screen um, because I want to talk about these sources. So um, these sources or this question was really not so much about the history of the French Revolution, but about what we call the historiography of the French Revolution. Um, history is events that happen. Histor historiography is a term we use to describe the history of the history of a thing. So how um, historians' interpretations of history have changed over time. And so that's what we're looking at here. So you were given with this uh, particular question, uh, two historians, I've never actually heard of either of them, and that doesn't matter. They don't want you to have necessarily memorized these uh, people's views. But um, both of these historians are writing in fairly recent times, the 1980s and 90s, compared to the French Revolution or more than a century later. So it's not, uh, this is not a uh, change in continuity over time. But um, the two authors are offering two different interpretations of uh, the, the plot and the meaning of the French Revolution. So uh, I'm actually going to read these to some degree at you and talk about them as we go. So the first author, uh, the first historian, his name is Edward Berenson, um, and uh, he is um, he is actually not necessarily offering his own view here, but he's reciting one traditional viewpoint of the French Revolution. So let me kind of uh, read and discuss that with you. So source number one, uh, Berenson writes, the development of capitalism in early modern France, so the argument goes, uh, this is where he indicates it's not necessarily his argument, but it's a popular argument. So so the argument grows, the development of capitalism created a rising bourgeoisie, increasingly frustrated after 1750 by the nobility's monopoly over political power and social privilege. In 1789, its leaders, the bourgeoisie's leaders, found a political opening in the crown's financial disarray and used it to elbow the nobility aside and assume power for themselves. And the fearsome violence of the revolution itself found its explanation, even justification, in the bourgeoisie's need to enlist the popular classes in the effort to overthrow the nobility once and for all. The reaction of Thermidor, the Thermidorian reaction that I talked about in our last video, the reaction of Thermidor, which followed the execution of Robespierre, represented the bourgeoisie's desire to rein in uh, the working class that had threatened to go too far, and that uh, Napoleon could be seen as the product of the bourgeoisie's effort to stabilize its institutions and economic position in the wake of a decade of revolutionary upheaval and war. Okay, so the view Ber Berenson is promoting here, or is reciting, um, is the view that the story of the revolution is really the story of the bourgeoisie, and that throughout it's all about the bourgeoisie all the time. Um, that in 1789 it was the bourgeoisie uh, that got together to really take action. It was the bourgeoisie that seceded from the uh, Estates General, the bourgeoisie that took the uh, tennis court oath, the bourgeoisie that wrote the Declaration of the Rights of Man, that formed the National Assembly. Um, when the bourgeoisie needed help, they would sometimes use other groups. For instance, they used uh, the Paris Commune, the poor. Uh, sans culotte of Paris um, to uh, to help them uh, overthrow the nobility and kill off their enemies. But as soon as the uh, the working class got too out of hand, uh, these poor people of Paris, uh, the bourgeoisie then used the Thermidorian reaction to get rid of Robespierre, uh, to shut down the Paris Commune, and to retake full control of the revolution. And uh, he mentions at the end, Napoleon, he's not really talking just about Napoleon, but he says Napoleon could even be seen in this viewpoint as uh, the product of the bourgeoisie, that the bourgeoisie allowed uh, someone to come to power with dictatorial powers. Why would the bourgeoisie allow this? Because it allowed them to consolidate their gains. Uh, so the economic and social gains that the bourgeoisie had made, Napoleon made them official and permanent and stabilized them. So it's not necessarily Berenson's view, but it's the view that Berenson is is reciting for us, is the view that it, the whole story of the French Revolution is the story 
of the bourgeoisie uh, and its attempt to gain power. Now, source number two then um, mentions something that we kind of need to connect these two sources, and that is uh, Marxist history. So, um, and this is where it gets, uh, I think these sources are very challenging. So um, he mentions at the beginning, Simon Schama, uh, author of source number two, mentions at the beginning Marxism. Um, and so uh, we need to make that connection. We did this a little bit in class with uh, Frederick Engels, The Condition of the Working Class in England. So Engels and later Karl Marx are the fathers of socialist communist type thought. And the view that Berenson gave us in source number one is um, basically the Marxist view of not just the French Revolution, but all of history. Marxism, Marxism views the whole story of history as always the middle class trying to keep the poor down, trying to use the working class to their own benefit. The whole story of all of history is about um, the, the middle class or what they would label the bourgeoisie trying to stick it to the man, you know, keep the keep the man down um, and uh, and, you know, keep the proletariat in its place. Um, and so the view that Berenson, Berenson is not a Marxist, but he's reciting kind of the Marxist interpretation. And Shama mentions the Marxist interpretation as well, that uh, that it's, you know, in the Marxist view, it's always about the bourgeoisie all the time. So this opening paragraph that Shama has, uh, which Shama is actually writing several years before Berenson, Source 2 is written six years before Source 1, not that that really matters, but Shama says, on closer examination, the drastic social changes imputed to the revolution or credited to the revolution seem less clear-cut or are actually not apparent at all. The bourgeoisie are said, in the classic Marxist accounts, to have been the authors and beneficiaries of the event. Shama's going to disagree with them, though. He says, however, continuities between pre-revolutionary and revolutionary France seem as marked as discontinuities. So Shama is going to openly disagree with the Marxist view. Um, and so he continues, what does he think then is the plot? He says, uh, Shama continues, nor does the revolution seem any longer to conform to a grand historical design preordained by inexorable forces of social change. Instead, it seems to Shama, a thing of contingencies and unforeseen consequences, not the least, not least the summoning of the Estates General itself. And instead of a single revolution imposed by Paris on the rest of a homogenous France, the course of the revolution in the provinces, or outside of Paris, the countryside, was often determined by local passions and interests. Understanding the role of individual agency has become correspondingly more important. So for Shama, the the um, the story of the revolution is not there. Almost isn't a story of the revolution, um, at least not a one that has like a consistent trend throughout. Uh, he says the story of the revolution is really the story of individuals acting in their own self interest at given times, and that the major shifts in the revolution were all sort of if not random, at least unpredictable, just individuals doing something for their own benefit. And he gives you one example of this. He mentions the calling of the Estates General. Uh, why was that? Why was the Estates General called in 1789? It was called because Louis XVI wanted cash. So in no way is that event, that huge event in the revolutionary history, creditable to the bourgeoisie. They had 0% to do with that. Um, and yet it happened and it had consequences and it led to things. Um, and I think we could come up with lots of other similar examples examples. We could say, um, you know, Charlotte Corday murdering Jean-Paul Marat, the voice of the revolution, um, or possibly uh, the guillotining of Maximilien Robespierre, um, or even uh, Napoleon's military successes, or foreign countries invading France. The bourgeoisie didn't have anything to do with any of these factors, um, and yet all of them really, like, moved the revolution in new directions. And so Shama's argument is that there isn't a consistent story, that uh, we, we cannot, we as much as we might sometimes love to, to lump everything together into a consistent story of, of one group uh, being the main character, they're almost is no main character. Lots of individuals uh, were their own character, their own main character, and they played profoundly big roles, outsized roles uh, for who they were. All right, so those are our two documents. And uh, these questions, which you may see, like it would not surprise me on the AP test if you got a question in this format where you, you do, you might get a question that is about the history, but also they, they frequently like this sort of question where they want you to see what are other historians interpreting uh, as far as that history. So these questions tend to be, um, and, and these sub-questions are really about the historians, not the history. Um, so let's take a look at those real quick. Uh, again, forgive me reading past you and scrolling down. All right, so 
Subquestion A. Explain how the reaction of Thermidor, as described by Berenson, source one, represents one broad historical development of the French Revolution. So, um, basically this wants to know, do you know what Berenson is saying? And also, these questions are always designed for you to have to properly interpret the source and also have to know your history. So in this case, if you didn't know what the Thermidorian reaction was, you probably missed this point, uh, regardless of whether you interpreted the, the source correctly or not. Um, if you still don't know what the, what the Thermidorian reaction is, check out my video from two days ago, and I explain it uh, pretty um, thoroughly there. But uh, in this case, because we know that Berenson is reciting the view that it's always about the bourgeoisie, the Thermidorian reaction, which is the overthrow of Robespierre, and uh, the reigning in of the reign of terror, and the institution of the directory, uh, we know from Berenson's um, uh, stated view here that it would simply be that the Thermidorian reaction would be an attempt by the bourgeoisie to control the trajectory of the revolution um, and uh, to rein in the power of other groups, specifically the sans-culottes and the Paris Commune. Um, Subquestion B, describe one way in which developments both authors discuss are connected to economic and social changes in the 1700s. Uh, this is a tough question because it, it starts, like the, the it mentions the authors early in the question, but if you look closely at the question, it's not really a question about the authors. It's really a question about the end of the question, which is economic and social changes in the 1700s. So it opens the door to the whole 1700s, not just the last decade during which the revolution was taking place. Probably the easiest thing to talk about would be just the rise into existence of the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie had not existed, um, you know, in the 1600s, and uh, came into its existence as a as a middle class in the 1700s. Uh, so that would be an easy way to uh, to grab this point. Um, there are certainly other uh, economic things um, that you could talk about, say like uh, the growing debt of the French monarchy and things like that. Um, but uh, any of those, and, and as long as they connect to anything that the authors talked about in a general sort of way, you're good. Um, step C uh, is really sort of what I've already done for you. Describe one major difference in the author's discussions of the causes and consequences of the French Revolution. Um, and uh, it really is, can you identify the claim uh, or thesis of each author? And as I mentioned uh, earlier, to, to quickly summarize, Berenson is promoting the view that the whole revolution is the story of the bourgeoisie, um, trying to um, improve its own status and uh, using other groups as necessary. Um, but really, it's all about the bourgeoisie trying to do its thing. And, uh, and Simon Shama, the second source, um, his, uh, his view is that the causes and consequences of the French Revolution are not consistent, that there isn't a trend, and it's simply individuals acting in their own best interest um, as time went on. So uh, anyway, these are, these are tough questions, and they're questions that uh, I think um, were tough because of the time constraint. I, I think it was tough. And also, I don't love that the AP actually included this question um, right now, because if you're doing these progress checks at the end of each unit, we hadn't really gotten to Marxism or, or Marxist interpretations of history yet. Um, we, we did eventually in, in topic six, but um, I think it it uh, put you at a disadvantage on that particular uh, question. But now you know, um, and uh, hopefully that makes sense to you. If you have any questions, please email me. Um, I am, uh, I'm glad to hear from you and uh, glad to try to explain these things. So um, anyway, just to, and to quickly wrap up, um, if, you, um, if you have not taken a look at this question, please look at it again. Um, when it comes to the AP test, as I said, we won't know more for a couple of weeks uh, as far as what the format of the test would look like, but because they've said 45 minutes, my best guess, my I mean, I'd you know, bet some money on it, and I don't really bet money on much, uh, but my bet would be that you'd have 25 or 30 multiple choices and that you'll have a couple of short answer questions. And when they do the short answer questions, almost always they like to do one that asks you about the history and then one that asks you to interpret historians' words. Um, and so when you see that, when you see that you've got a couple of sources by historians, um, you need to not only understand them, um, what they're saying in and of themselves, but understand how those two historians' views relate to each other. Uh, these sources will never be chosen just randomly. Uh, they will be designed to kind of say something different from each other and get you to talk about uh, those differences. So, 
Um, anyway, that's my, uh, that's my help for you for today. Uh, I hope you have a great weekend and, um, I, uh, I wish you all well. And if there's anything I can do to help you in this class or even beyond, if you need somebody to be kind of a voice between you and, uh, and the administration or whatever, please let me know that too. Um, still here to serve you and I miss you guys and I wish you well. Bye.